Hello, my name is Benji and welcome to Dice vs Cards. Today we explore a hybrid miniatures game in the form of Warhammer Underworlds. Originally released in 2017 with Shadespire, the game has since fairly predictably rolled out season based content, with each one being launched with its own core set. And that's then followed up by expansion packs in the shape of new warbands, until the new base set presses the soft reset button at the end of every year. So as you would expect, each cycle has to bring something new and fresh and exciting to keep people's interest. And so here we arrive at the whole point of this here video, to chronicle each of the seasons to date and detail what thematic and mechanical changes arrived on their coattails and how we arrived here at this point with the newly released Season 4 box set, Diachasm. So as I've already mentioned, the year is 2017, and the name on the box is Shadespire, a medium box game that showed some real promise of being a tightly designed hybrid miniatures ball game, featuring the poster boys of Age of Sigmar, the Stormcoast Eternals, and as a mirror of its parent miniature wargame starter set, it was accompanied by a warband of Blades of Corn. The box came with everything you needed to play a two-player game of the Warhammer Underworlds. And thematically speaking, this was the setting of the scene. The titular city was the breeding ground for a magical mirror-like substance named Shade Glass, which would inexplicably allow the souls of the dead to live on. However, the self-titled Lord of Death, Nagash, did not like this not one bit, and so cast the city of Shadespire out of Shaish, the realm of death, where it had previously called its home. This was the vanilla Warhammer Underworlds experience, but the core mechanics were all there, and resulted in a winning combination of beautiful minis, neat deck construction elements that saw you picking and choosing your skills and abilities, as well as your objectives and means to score points, all on a board with hexes and opposed check dice rolls. This to me was what a hybrid miniature tabletop ball game should look like. 2018 then brought the second season core set of Nightfall which was almost a like-for-like -like setup in terms of contents to its predecessor, and once again pitted a warband of the Stormcast Eternals, up this time against the similar to the box named Nighthaunt, a posse of undead that would be unleashed on the citizens of Shadespire by none other than the still very pissed off Nagash. These Thorns of the Briar Queen as they were known were only the tip of the spear though, as the Night Vault that could be found deep beneath the city housed any number of foul never-do-wells and creatures. What Night Vault did bring to the table other than a host of new warbands though was access to spells, something that was sorely missing from Season 1 and a pitch-perfect mechanical addition a year into the game's life cycle. This opened up a great deal of range-based strategy, which to date had focused a little bit more on close combat, and to my mind at least, was the missing piece of the equation. By the time Season 3 had rolled round with the release of Beast Grave, the competitive scene was well and truly up and running, and for the first time we had two brand new warbands to choose from with the Beastmen represented by Grashrax Despoilers, and a new race named Kurnothi, whose closest thematic kin would be the Wood Elves, or the Sylvaneth, and these were represented by Scaith's Wild Hunt. The setting this time shifted to the aforementioned mountain range of Beastgrave, neatly ensconced within the realm of beasts with those having been previously locked inside the metaphysical confines of Shadespire, set free as a byproduct of the Necroquake, a massive explosion of death magic caused by Nagash again, which awoke hordes of undead throughout the mortal realms. Mechanically speaking, there wasn't anything groundbreaking like magic that was introduced for Season 3, 
but it was a time for consolidation. As I've already mentioned, this is a game conceived and supported to have a competitive scene. But unfortunately for the G-Dub, they'd got themselves in a bit of a pickle with some of the terminology and rules as written that they concocted. So Beast Grave was very much the beginning of a much more streamlined version of the game in terms of universal keywords and stricter and more mapped out turn sequences. It also introduced a form of rotation in the deck building. And so this here was how the game would tackle and attempt to provide a stable and balanced meta to the format. In between seasons 3 and 4 we got a multiplayer gift from the gods in the form of Arena Mortis. A formalised and fleshed out variant rule set that can allow you to use the same boards but have up to 6 players vying for victory in a more gladiatorial esque format where you take control of just one model. The idea is you pimp said fighter up to the nines and have a merry free for all with your buddies. Very much geared towards a casual audience, I think most Warhammer Underworlds players appreciate that it's a secondary option to them, especially if the number of players around the table isn't conducive to some conventional 1v1 action. Thematically speaking, things got even weirder at this point as it turns out a whirling vortex was created as another byproduct and unintended consequence of the necroquake. Now warriors that were contained within would instantly return to life upon death, in so doing creating what you would consider super soldier versions of themselves, more than powerful enough to warrant you as a player being satisfied with playing just one piece of plastic for up to an hour or so. Which brings us neatly up to date with the release of Diachasm, which retains the setting of Beast Grave, but there's some new blood in town. One in the form of the Luminef Elves, represented by Miari's Purifiers, who are looking to quell the monstrous heart of Beast Grave. And then the not so pure Hedonites of Slanesh, represented here by the Dread Pageant just looking to spread some good old fashioned toil and torment. Unfortunately from a mechanical standpoint there isn't much to shout from the rooftops about here. Extra glory for dealing with high wound targets, streamlined support rules and some new event types and formats. All of which amounts to the very least you'd expect from a new season. I for one will be looking for Season 5 to make a grander, gameplay centric entrance. That being said, new warbands are new warbands and I'd rather have this than a kick in the chats. And so on that note I can safely say I brought to you a chronological history of Warhammer Underworlds. In a bridge format of course. It should also be noted that as of the publishing of this video, only Beast Grave, Arena Mortis and Diachasm remain in print. So you'll have to look to the secondary market if you want to get your hands on Shades Bar or Night Vault. Stay tuned for likely more WHU content. However, that's it from me. I'll see you next time.